Good morning, Community Church, and happy Reformation Day. It is so nice to be back behind the pulpit in front of all of you again. For those who do not know me, my name is Taylor Hillman, and I'll be your guest preacher for today. As I always do, I like to put in a little plug for the Young Adults Group that is supported by Community Church. We meet here at Community Church on Tuesday evenings. If you can consider yourself to be in the age range of a young adult, or if you are just interested in joining the group regardless of your age, I'd love to talk to you after service and invite you to our study. My contact information is on our pamphlet, and you can reach me that way too. Otherwise, you can just show up. We'd love to have you there. It is an honor to be granted another opportunity to preach the truth of God's word. Before I start, let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, today's message is a somber reminder of the reality of our calling. We are currently facing an ever-increasingly hostile world that rejects your truth and mocks your holy word. As followers of you, Lord, we face the inevitability of rejection, mocking, and suffering. Remind us today of our faithfulness, of your faithfulness, Lord. Remind us that you knew us before you formed us in the womb. Remind us of our election and of the hope we have in Christ Jesus. Prepare us for suffering in Christ's name and bring us joy in our knowledge of the sovereignty of God and the calling that he has charged to us as Christ's followers. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As I have stated earlier, today is Reformation Day. As the world celebrates the occult and death, we celebrate something completely different. There may be some of you who are unaware of the significance of today, and there may be some of you who are well aware of how important today is. In short, Reformation Day marks the day Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses against the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. This is what we are recognizing today. This act sparks the Protestant Reformation, which brought forth the true gospel of Jesus Christ. After that, there are about a million things we can talk about. There is so much I can say about Reformation Day that in my previous draft of this sermon, I spent the length of a normal sermon painstakingly summarizing the following. Who is Martin Luther? What are the 95 Theses? What are indulgences? Why is purgatory unbiblical? The false gospel of the Roman Catholic Church? The theological differences between the church in Rome and the Protestant denominations? The Pope and papacy have the authority to forgive sins? The Diet of Worms? The Council of Trent? Justification by grace alone through faith alone apart from works? Seven verses that clearly teach that doctrine? And I even went into the feudal system of Europe and how the Roman Catholic Church held the highest degree of authority based on that system. <laughs> I found myself trying to fit three months of Sunday services plus a few academic lectures into one sermon. In doing so, I, find my, I found myself totally negating the topic at which I have committed myself to preaching. That topic being suffering for the truth. If we were to boil down the Protestant Reformation to some of its simplest understandings, we would see millions of true believers of the gospel of Jesus Christ suffering for the truth, many of which suffered for the truth at the hands of the church in Rome. To get a picture of what this looks like, I would like to read a few accounts from Fox's Book of the Martyrs from the time period of Luther's day which falls into the time period of the Protestant Reformation. So we can get an understanding of what would happen to those who spoke out against the false doctrines of Roman Catholicism. I encourage everyone here to buy Fox's Book of the Martyrs, which has stood the test of secular scrutiny and historical critiques to prove itself to be an historically accurate and comprehensive log of the time period. Personally, for myself, reading this book has brought on such a perspective that those things in my life that I consider to be wrought with turmoil and strife, to be of little concern compared to our brothers and sisters in Christ who know what it truly means to suffer for the truth. First account. 
Henry Sutphin, an eloquent and pious preacher, was taken out of his bed in the middle of the night and compelled to walk barefoot a considerable way, so that his feet were terribly cut. He desired a horse, but his conductor said, in derision, a horse for a heretic? No, no, heretics may go barefoot. When he arrived at the place of his destination, he was condemned to be burnt. But during the execution, many indignities were offered to him, as those who attended, not content with what he suffered in the flames, cut and slashed him in the most terrible manner. Next account. Peter Spengler, a pious divine of the town of Chalette, was thrown into the river and drowned. Before he was taken to the banks of the stream, which was to become his grave, they led him to the marketplace that his crimes might be proclaimed, which were not going to mass, not making confession, and not believing in transubstantiation, which is the Roman Catholic belief that when you take communion, the bread transforms into the actual flesh of Jesus and the wine transforms into the actual blood of Christ. After the ceremony was over, he made a most excellent discourse to the people and concluded with a kind hymn a very dignifying nature, edifying nature. A Protestant gentleman in the next account, being ordered to lose his head for not renouncing his religion, went cheerfully to the place of execution. A friar came to him and said these words in a low tone of voice, as you have a great reluctance publicly to abjure your faith, whisper your confession in my ear, and I will absolve your sins. To this gentleman, to this the gentleman loudly replied, Trouble me not, friar. I have confessed my sins to God and obtained absolution through the merits of Jesus Christ. Then turning to the executioner, he said, Let me not be pestered with these men, but perform your duty, on which his head was struck off a single blow. These are just three people out of millions of martyrs throughout world history. All of them endured a martyr's death because they were willing to suffer for the truth. Some through extreme and brutal suffering, some did lovingly, while others did with tremendous courage. Reformation Day is about the true gospel of Jesus Christ first and foremost, but it's also a time to reflect on those who suffered for the true gospel in which we proclaim here at Community Church. It is in this context that we enter into our text this morning. Today we'll be in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah. We'll be focusing our attention on chapter 20, verses 7 through 18. You can turn your attention to our portion of scripture, but it, it is imperative, before I read the passage out loud, that I set the historical context of the passage as well as the predicament that Jeremiah finds himself in that leads to his final complaint or confession to God. If you are familiar at all with your Old Testament history, the kingdom that was ruled by King Saul and then King David and finally King Solomon was split into two after Solomon's death. There is the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. These two kingdoms had various kings who, by their rule, either did good or evil in God's sight. Famously, the northern kingdom of Israel did not have a single good king and was taken into captivity by the Assyrians. In Christ's day, the area of the northern kingdom was known as Samaria. The southern kingdom of Judah, on the other hand, had a mixture of good and evil kings. The southern kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity by the nation of Babylon, by King Nebuchadnezzar with the first deportation in 605 BC, second deportation in 597 BC, and the third deportation in 588 BC. These periods of exile from the land that God promised them is a judgment by God on Israel for hundreds of years of rebellion against God, blatant idolatry, failure to keep God's commandments, and a host of other egregious sins. Prior to the exile from the land that God promised the Israelites, the Lord sent prophets to the nation to rebuke and warn the people of God's impending judgment. As we see time and time again with the prophets, the people do not repent, and the wrath of God is poured out onto his people. 
Jeremiah is one of these prophets sent by God. He is known as the weeping prophet for he suffered for the truth throughout his ministry in the southern kingdom of Judah. There is so much that we can take from Jeremiah's ministry, but what we are focusing on today is how Jeremiah responds to suffering for it is unique among the scriptures. The uniqueness comes from how brutal it can be to hear it. His suffering and his despair are so clearly evident in some cases that there are many commenters that struggle with the question of why Jeremiah is saying the things that he says. Jeremiah also stands out on how the world will treat you when you speak the truth of God. Jeremiah spoke of God's impending judgment on Judah and he suffered greatly for it. These sufferings recorded down as Jeremiah's trials offer us as Christians a unique understanding of suffering. As I've stated previously, we'll be in Jeremiah 27 through 18. This portion of scripture is Jeremiah lamenting and complaining to God either during or after his third major trial. This trial is recorded as the trial by stocks. Before we read the scripture, I'll be setting the scene and the circumstances of how Jeremiah finds himself in such despair. In Jeremiah, chapter 19, just finishing following the commands of the Lord to pronounce judgment upon Judah, judgment falls on Judah because the, kings, or the sins of King Manasseh, who reigned from 696 B.C. to 642 B.C. You can read the historical accounts of this king in 2 Kings 21, 1 through 9, and 2 Chronicles 31, or 33, 1 through 20. We'll start by reading the account in 2 Kings 21, 1 through 9. Will be projected on the screen. Second Kings twenty one one through nine. Manasseh was twelve years old when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty five years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hebzibah, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done, and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I'll put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, And he burned his son as an offering and used fortune-telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And he carved images of the Asherah that he had made. He set in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever." And I will not cause the feet of Israel to wander any more out of the land that I gave to their fathers, if only they will be careful to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen, and Manasseh led them astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. King Manasseh's sins were many. He rebuilt altars to false foreign gods. He worshipped false foreign gods. He desecrated the temple of the Lord by putting these altars and worshipping at these altars inside the Lord's temple. Instead of going to the Lord, he relied on fortune-telling, omens, mediums, and necromancers. To appease the false foreign gods, he burned his son in sacrifice and led the men of Judah to do the same. King Manasseh did more to lead Israel astray than any foreign nation could have done. Because of this great evil and wickedness, God's judgment will fall on Judah, and he charges Jeremiah to pronounce that judgment, as well as prophesize what is to come. We find this account in Jeremiah 19, the chapter before 20, 19, 6 through 13. Therefore, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall no more be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Himon. 
of the valley of slaughter. And in this place, I will make void the plans of Judah and Jerusalem and will cause their people to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their life. I will give their dead bodies for food to the birds and of the air and to the beasts of the earth. And I will make this city a horror, a thing to be hissed at, Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of its wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbors in the siege and in the distress which, with which their enemies and those who seek their life afflict them. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you, and shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, so I will break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel, so that, I, so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Tophet, because there will be no place else to bury. Thus will I do to this place, declares the Lord, and to its inhabitants, making this city like Tophet the house of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah, all the houses on whose roofs offerings have been offered to all the host of heaven and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods shall be defiled like the place of Tophet. If you were not awake before, surely you are awake now. The words of Jeremiah prophesize, prophesizing for the Lord have pronounced judgment on Judah. And here we see what the end result of that judgment will be. That being the utter destruction of Jerusalem and the many disasters that follow in the wake of Jerusalem's destruction. This prophecy is about the siege of Jerusalem, which takes place roughly nine years after Jeremiah makes this prophecy in 597 BC. The account of which is recorded in 2 Kings 25, Jeremiah 39, and 2 Chronicles 36. We know this prophecy in Jeremiah 19 is about this event because 2 Chronicles 36, 21, it states to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Though it should be noted that there is more to this prophecy that includes the Sabbath that I will not get into today. With the scene set and a clear understanding of what's happening, one is to wonder what the reaction was of the religious leaders. What were the people of Judah going to do about this judgment and prophecy by Jeremiah? According to the first portion of Jeremiah 20, the chief of the guard of the temple had Jeremiah arrested, beaten, and placed into the stocks because of the prophecy that he spoke. If you have been patiently waiting to read our text for today, it is here where we will start. Here is the passage reading, Jeremiah 20, 7 through 18. O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry out and I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. Will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts who test the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the head of the evildoers. 
the hand of the evildoers. Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news of my father, the news to my father, a son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother could have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out of the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? There's a lot to unpack in these verses. Jeremiah goes from accusing God of being deceitful, complaining to God about his situation, remembering and rejoicing in God's character, and then goes back into the pit of despair. I have five takeaways I would like to discuss with you this morning on Jeremiah 27 through 18. Number one, following Christ will lead to suffering. And I have two points to this. Because human expectations don't always match with reality. And because people hate the truth. Number two, proclaiming truth will lead to division. Number three, in the midst of suffering, the word of God should hold us captive to his faithfulness. Number four, suffering and depression are compatible with great faith. Number five, we are allowed to question God in faith. I'll give some time for people to write stuff down if they're writing. We can just keep this up for a second. Jeremiah is a book filled with suffering, and it can be so easy for us to leave church this morning feeling heavy hearted. There will be words of encouragement as well as profound truths about how God works in our lives that should instill within us confidence. Endure this with me as we start the exposition. When we think of prophets, we seem to look at them as mighty men of God. Take Elijah. He he combated the pagan cults and destroyed Jezebel's false prophets on Mount Carmel. Or Daniel who boldly proclaimed the writing on the wall and braved the lion's den. Or maybe what could be more familiar to you is the boldness in which John the Baptist stood up to the religious leaders of his day. However, when it comes to Jeremiah, it is refreshing to see that he is as human as any of us sitting in this room. We find Jeremiah either still in the stocks or freshly out of them, grappling with What has just happened to him? He first proclaims that God deceived him, then complains to God that everyone is laughing at him, mocking him, and shouting at him. He complains that the word of the Lord is a reproach to him, and it holds him in derision for the entire day. Let's unpack this with the first half of point one. Following Christ will lead to suffering because human expectations don't always match with reality. I empathize with Jeremiah because I imagine him beat up, cut up, bloody, exhausted, humiliated, and in utter despair. He is a prophet of the Lord. Why is God allowing this to happen to him? He feels betrayed. He feels that God has gone back on his promises to him. What are the promises that Jeremiah is referencing when he says, you have deceived me? Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you, appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1, 8. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. Jeremiah 1, 10. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to be plucked up and to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Jeremiah 1, 18 through 19, and I, and I, behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, 
but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. These verses are taken from the very beginning of Jeremiah's calling. No doubt, as he is in the depths of despair over his beating and humiliation, he is thinking to himself, God, if you knew me, why would you do this to me? Or God, I thought you were to deliver me from these situations. Or God, how am I to pluck up, break down, destroy, overthrow, build, and plant when I was completely and utterly beaten and chastised? How often in our Christian walks do we look at the promises of God and feel discouraged that we are not seeing those promises right now? How often do we struggle with the faithfulness of God because we are not seeing what we know he promises? I will hearken back to the purposes of suffering from last week's sermon to reveal our spiritual condition, to humble us, to draw us near him, to display his grace, and to show the perfection of his power. As humans, we draw up so many expectations in how we would have things or how we would like to see things play out. God does not bend reality to our expectations. Oftentimes, it is our expectations that sets us up for suffering. Remember, God is sovereign and he will do what he wills. If that means we are to suffer, then that means we are going to suffer. That does not mean that God leaves us and forsakes us. That does not mean God has deceived us because we know that God is holy and the action of deceitfulness has no place in God's character whatsoever. God gives us grace. We do not withstand suffering on our own power for if we were to rely on ourselves, we will be completely lost. Psalm 40, verse 11 As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Take heart, community church. When our expectations don't match the reality of our situation, when we contend and battle for the faith, it is not our strength but the Lord's which brings us through and preserves us. The second point of the first point, following Christ will lead to suffering because people hate the truth. We must also analyze the nature of Jeremiah's message. He was a doomsday preacher. When he spoke, he spoke of impending judgment. What Jeremiah could also be feeling at this moment is that he has been speaking of impending judgment for roughly 21 years at this point, and the judgment has not yet happened. I'm sure you start to question what God has been telling you during this point. Let us parallel this with our Christian walk. We are commissioned in Matthew 28 to go make disciples of all the nations. We are to spread the gospel to the world. For someone to truly come to Christ, they must repent. As John the Baptist would say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, or has come near. The implication of repentance is for a person to recognize their own sinful nature, which essentially means they must recognize that they are evil. How many people have you presented the gospel to have rejected the message? How many in their rejection of the gospel laughed at you, mocked you, and shouted at you? To the unregenerate unregenerate person, the gospel is offensive because they must reckon with their sinful self. Just as Jeremiah's message was offensive to the people and religious leaders of Judah because they were convinced that God would never send them into exile. Just as the people today are convinced that they are good people and don't deserve to go to hell. Ultimately, if you were to follow Christ as he commands us to do, the word of the Lord will become a reproach to you, and it will cause you to be in derision. For our worldview does not match the views of the world today, nor will it ever match. How many of us are willing to go into a public space and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? I would say that many of us would have to think about the implications of what that would mean for us personally. Would you be ready and willing to speak truthfully about sin? homosexuality, 
gender identities, abortion, false religions, and a whole myriad of topics that our culture enjoys canceling people over? When we, as Christians, stand for the truth, we must remember that those who do not recognize biblical truth will hate us. In 1 Kings 22, 6 through 8, we see a perfect example of this concerning King Ahab, who was trying to decide if he should go to war. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead? Or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hands of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? For the 400 prophets that King Ahab had were false. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, but I hate him, for he never prophesies as good concerning me, but evil. In the sea of all this world has to offer to human beings, the truth is the last thing people seek. For it is the truth that makes us reckon with our very conscience and sinful nature, We only need to look at Jesus Christ, who in the words of John was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, to get an understanding of how people react when the truth is revealed to them. Christ's destination was always the cross, for the Word of the Lord will bring forth suffering because people hate the truth. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Take heart, community church. We know the truth, and we know the truth because God has revealed it to us. It is by God's power that we are saved, and it's by God's power, not our own, that lets us persevere when we face the hatred of the world. Point number two, proclaiming truth will lead to division. Evidently, Jeremiah wanted to stop being a prophet. For it says in the text, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, clearly Jeremiah has tried to stop being a prophet. He can't stand the treatment he has received from his countrymen. He can't stand the abuse and physical punishment he is receiving. He can't stand how awful his life seems to be. Have you found yourself in this position? Have you found yourself hearing lies and simply for the sake of not getting into it, you don't say anything? Have you found yourself in the midst of people taking the Lord's name in vain and do not say anything? When we speak God's truth, it is a sword that will divide. Matthew 10, 34, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, I have come to bring I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Jeremiah knew this and understood this and he didn't want to be a prophet because if it sorry <laughs> Jeremiah knew this and understood this and he didn't want to be a prophet. But he does say there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones and I am weary with holding it in. And I cannot. I've heard it said that Christians tend to divide because we are so reluctant and outright refuse to recant what we believe. For Jeremiah, he couldn't refuse his calling. He was convicted by the word of God and the word of God was in his heart. For us Christians, we have the Holy Spirit that convicts us and we know the truth and we can test the spirits and understand what is true and what is not. For the truth is in us, and if we conform ourselves to the image of Christ, we will not be able to withhold our convictions due to our sanctification. As we looked at the last portion of this section, Jeremiah mentions his close friends and how his close friends are watching for his fall and are making plots against him. We 
here we see the division as clear as day. His closest friends have now turned away from Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is without his human companions. To further quote Matthew 10, but verses 35 through 36, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. For we know that the truth will divide a family. Surely the truth will also divide you from your closest of friends. Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. And all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Take heart, community church. For when our beliefs divide and we lose those we love because of the truth, it is by the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit, not the power of yourself, that preserves you through the storm. Point number three. In the midst of suffering, the word of God should hold us captive to his faithfulness. Jeremiah, even though he is suffering immensely for boldly proclaiming God's truth was reluctant to throw away what he knew to be true of God. He describes God as being his dread warrior. According to Jeremiah, God's role as his dread warrior is to make his persecutors stumble, stop his persecutors from overcoming him, to shame his persecutors, to make sure his persecutors don't succeed, to give them eternal dishonor that will never be forgotten. What we see here is Jeremiah has a clear understanding of the wrath of God and has faith that God will serve justice. Jeremiah correctly approaches the situation. He does not go out for his vengeance, but leaves God to do the work. Romans 12, 19 highlights this proper response. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And Psalm 711 also provides an understanding as God is judge. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Even though he questioned God earlier and was ensnared by despair due to his suffering, he does not allow his feelings to negate his understanding of God. The word of God and Jeremiah's knowledge of God is sustaining him. Jeremiah also recognizes that God knows his heart. God knows that he has committed his cause to him. God is not all of a sudden ignorant of or to our sinful nature. He chooses sinners to do his work. Just because Jeremiah is a prophet doesn't mean all of a sudden he no longer sins. It is as if Jeremiah understands that God understands his situation, which causes him to rejoice and sing a hymn of praise. Sing to the Lord, praise to the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoers. One sees that Jeremiah is starting to come out of this attitude of despair. And, is, and this state of suffering and essentially reminded himself of who God is. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty option raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Take heart, community church. For when we suffer, for for when we are suffering for the truth, we must remember that we know the Lord, and that knowledge of the Lord brings with it the confidence of Christ who is within us. For when Christ is within us, we are in step with him, and our actions are his and not our own, for it is his power that sustains and preserves us, not our own. Suffering and depression are compatible with great faith, point number four. One can truly appreciate the humanness of Jeremiah and the roller coaster of his emotions. He goes from questioning to complaining 
to reminding himself of God's faithfulness, to singing a hymn of praise, to only drop to such deep depression, which leads him to wish that he was never born. I would be lying to you if I were to say I never felt this way in some way, shape, or form in my life. Just the up and down, the roller coaster of emotions. Just because we suffer or find ourselves in the midst of depression doesn't mean we are not Christians or don't have great faith. We live in a fallen world that does everything in its power to make you believe the lie. For before we were in Christ, Ephesians 2 states, you were dead in the trespasses and sins. We followed the prince of the power of the air and were by nature children of wrath. How often do we find ourselves being drawn back into this way of life? How often are we tempted to live under the authority of ourselves? The pull can be depressing and discouraging. There is encouragement in these moments of great depression and suffering of the faithful. Paul states in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. As easy as it is to look at Jeremiah's condition and see a man in despair, what we must also realize is his perseverance by the grace of God. This is not the end of Jeremiah. This fit of depression does not crush him or keep him in despair, or left forsaken, or completely destroyed. Jeremiah perseveres for the rest of his life. We will suffer. We will have difficulties. These things do not disqualify you from the body of Christ. This fit of depression, where Jeremiah curses the day of his birth, and the despair that he showcases, should also remind us that our sanctification is not an instantaneous and our sanctification is always ongoing. As I was preparing this sermon, I struggled mightily to put it together. There were many late nights and frustrations that led to doubt. Does that make me any less of a Christian? Does it make any of us any less of a Christian if we suffer or deal with anxiety or deal with depression? Absolutely not. The real world application of all of this is hard, but we have faith in the sanctifying, sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit, as well as the sustaining grace of God to help us move forward when we suffer. Ephesians 1, 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believe you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Take heart, community church. We have the promises of the Holy Spirit when we believe, and when we believe, we are marked in him with a seal. How comforting, through even the deepest of depressions, to know that our salvation is secure and our sanctification is not halted or stopped. Regardless of how much we contend for the faith and are tested in our resolve, the Holy Spirit, which has been granted to us for our faith, preserves us through God's power and not our own. Point number five, we are allowed to question God in faith. In my sermon last week, I posed the question, what right does the created, which is us, have to question the holy creator, which is God? What has been convicting me this week is that I don't think I actually answered the question. Jeremiah, in his complaint to God, questions God on why he is ever allowed to come out of his mother's womb. He questions God on why he must spend every day seeing toil and sorrow. Jeremiah has already shown he is living in faith, 
He has already committed himself to the charge that God gave him. Therefore, he is allowed to question God. It is written in James 1, 5 through 6, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. The difference we see in Jeremiah is that he has accepted his situation. His return to despair most likely is an acknowledgement that this will not be the last time he'll have to deal with this kind of treatment. This will not be the last time he will suffer for speaking the truth of God. In fact, compared to some of his future trials, this one is pretty tame. He knows that he can't keep the truth in, and the suffering will be a constant theme of his life. With this knowledge and his faith in God, his questions are acceptable. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life, is n- the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Take heart, community church, for we are in the body of Christ, and we live by the will of the Father. We have been crucified with Christ, and Christ lives in us. With this understanding, we live by faith even in the hardest, most difficult times in our lives. For it is Christ, through the works of the Holy Spirit, who sustains us through the suffering and guides us when we stand for the truth. As any sermon should do, we are to turn our attention to Christ. As Christians, we will be persecuted for our beliefs. This persecution will lead to suffering Christ lays this out and blesses us who do suffer for his sake. What we are to remember in this suffering is that there is purpose in it that is beneficial and profitable for our sanctification. Secondly, we are to understand that this will be our reality, and we must contend with that. We contend with that by knowing that people hate the truth, that the truth will divide, that even the word of God, which does divide, should hold us captive to its truths about who God is. And to know who God is, we are to recognize his faithfulness through the storm. We also need to understand that this is not an instantaneous process. We will find ourselves suffering over and over throughout our life, but that does not diminish our faith or our belief in the saving power of Jesus Christ. We then should come in confidence to the Lord with the question of why. For our faith allows us to, and we have a great high priest who is Christ Jesus that will understand our plea. Many Christians look at Jeremiah and are discouraged. Some even avoid Jeremiah altogether. It can be difficult to look at his pain and suffering and look at our own lives and think, I could never go through something like that. In all honesty, I couldn't go through that either. At least, I couldn't go through that alone and under my own strength. We must not forget that we are not alone because we are in Christ. We must not forget that it is by Christ's power that we are sustained and we persevere. We'll end the book, we'll end in the book of Lamentations which is also authored by Jeremiah. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. Take heart, community church, as I have asked you all morning long, 
When we suffer, toil, contend, and fight for the faith, we do so through the power of God and not by our own ability. For it is the Lord who sustains us in all things. All of our hope is in him. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the book of Jeremiah. For it is profitable for us in understanding suffering and how we are to deal with our suffering. Thank you for this congregation. We, as the body of Christ, are family to one another. We do not need to endure our suffering alone. My prayer, Lord, is that if there are members here who are suffering, that they seek out their brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, that we may endure that suffering with them and be a constant support in their time of need. Lord, I pray for our endurance and our character, which brings forth and produces hope, which is the hope in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the spread of the true gospel of Jesus Christ for which we are saved by justification, by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from works. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.